good morning, Emmanuel family. I'm speaking to you from my garden in Yarrow, which is on the Stalo unceded traditional territory of the Palalt and Chilquayuk tribes. Not far from here was the former Sumas Lake, where the Stalo people fished for salmon and sturgeon. The song you just heard is the call to worship. Both the words and the music were composed by Hildegard of Bingen, a German nun who was born over 900 years ago in the year 1098. This image that you see of her looking at the night sky is a self-portrait. She was a visual artist, prolific composer, poet, playwright, theologian. She even undertook several preaching tours and scientist. I'm only beginning to learn about her life and am looking forward to later in the service hearing from Greg Thiessen, who will be speaking about Hildegard as well as other important women in Christian history. Hildegard's song is a psalm for the Holy Spirit. Love abounds in all, from the depths exalted and excelling over every star. Although these words were written hundreds of years ago, she praises the same spirit of love that visited the early church at Pentecost. Tongues of flame above their heads and a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Last Saturday night, our house and yard were battered by a violent windstorm. And the next morning, Pentecost Sunday, branches strewn all over the grass. I couldn't help but think of the uncanny coincidence when I read about the violence shaking our neighbors to the south. Not tongues of fire, but buildings on fire in the aftermath of the unspeakable violence and injustice of George Floyd's death. I'd been reading an article about a black man named Jimmy Mills who owned a small barber shop in Minneapolis and was hoping to reopen soon with loosened restrictions after months of being closed by COVID. But his shop, along with many other small black owned businesses in the neighborhood, was burned to the ground in the protests. The front windows smashed, valuables stolen. I was crying on Pentecost morning for Jimmy Mills, for George Floyd and his family, and for countless others hit by violence and injustice. How can we keep silent? How can we respond? I longed to pray with you. I invite you now into a time of silent prayers for peace, followed by a litany for peace and justice. O oh God, the heavens are yours, and the earth is yours. All our life belongs to you. Make us messengers of peace and justice. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make us your messengers of peace and justice. May all injustice violence and oppression give way to fairness, mercy, and goodwill. Make us your messengers of peace and justice. Teach us to use the manifold resources of the earth so that none may waste and none may want. 
make us your messengers of peace and justice. In all our labors, may cooperation triumph over conflict. May all people find their reward in work that serves the good of all. Make us your messengers of peace and justice. Keep alive the holy fire within the hearts of all who dare to be the voices of unwelcome wisdom. Make us willing to hear hard demands. Make us your messengers of peace and justice. Fill us with a passion for righteousness and a zeal to serve where there is need. Fill us with a purpose that is holy and right and just. Make us your messengers of peace and justice. Unto you, O God, be all might and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen. Last week for Pentecost, we sang, Holy Spirit, come with power. I invite you to sing, this, sing again this wonderful hymn with text written by a remarkable woman of faith, Anne N. Rupp, who passed away this past January, who was the sister of Waldo Neufeld. Waldo will now say a few words about his sister and the hymn before we sing it. Good morning. Perhaps we share the experience of when a song leader introduces the author and the context when it was written, bringing new meaning to the hymn. I was asked to say something about the hymn selected for today's service, Come Holy Spirit. It was written by my sister Anne Neufeld Rupp, who passed away in Kansas in December of this past year. She was a person committed to service starting in the early 60s when she sensed a call to missionary work in the Congo. Due to the revolution there and the war, she was sent to Mexico by the mission board. George Edgar and Marie Froze from our church served with her at that location. She then pursued education, graduating from AMBS in 1966, where she also met and married Ken Rupp. They were trendsetters. Anne was the first woman to be ordained by the Central District of the General Conference Mennonite Church. Today there are 85 congregations in that region. Forty of them are led by women pastors. Anne and Ken were also determined to work at shared ministry and joint appointment, somewhat new in those days. While engaged in pastoral work, she did a lot of writing, five books, many articles, and curriculum, plus practicing her piano skills, teaching piano lessons throughout her lifetime until her health failed. The song number 26 was written when Ken was preparing a message, a sermon for that Saturday, concerned that he could not find a hymn that connected to his message which prompted Anne to write this hymn, and it was sung by the congregation the next morning. The hymn, Come Holy Spirit, has been included in hymn books for at least six faith groups, and also translated into German by the Mennonite Church in Paraguay, and into several languages in the Mennonite World Conference Circle. And reports are, it made the cut and will be included in the new hymnal coming out later this year. Come, Holy Spirit.
Hi, Emmanuel kids. I miss seeing you and I miss doing puppet shows with the junior youth for you at the church. Have you ever wondered about what it was like to live a long time ago? Today I want to tell you a little bit about a very interesting woman who lived over 900 years ago. Her name was Hildegard of Bingen and she lived in Germany. She wrote music and books and looked at the stars, as you can see in this picture of her, and painted pictures. In fact, she actually painted this picture of herself. And the beautiful song you heard at the beginning of the service, she wrote that too. When she was eight years old, she went to a monastery, which is a place where people go when they want to concentrate on living only for God. One of the things Hildegard did when she was your age was to memorize the Psalms from the Bible. In fact, I think when she got to be a teenager, she had all of the Psalms memorized. Can you believe that? Casey Wallace from our church happens to be eight years old, the same age Hildegard was when she entered the monastery. Let's listen to Casey reading Psalm 8. I am reading Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human begin beings that you care of them, you have made them a little lower than the angels. You and crown them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You got everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The end. Thank you so much, Casey. That was great. Now, Hildegard didn't learn the Psalms in English. So I'll give you three guesses for the language she used. No, not German, not French. It was Latin. Latin is a very difficult language to learn. Do you know anyone who knows how to speak Latin? I have a friend who does. He gave me a little lesson so that I could share with you how to say the first verse of Psalm 8 in Latin, like Hildegard. So the English words that Casey read for, the, for verse 1 are, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And here are the words in Latin. I'll read them slowly, and you can read along and learn how to say them too. Domine, Dominus, Noster quam, Admirabile est nomen, Tuum in universa terra. Great, let's say that one more time. Domine Dominus, Noster Quam, 
admirabile est nomen tuum in universa terra. Awesome. Your parents might have had a little trouble, so you can show them, um, teach them how to read it maybe after the service. Now, just for fun, I'd like to read you a shortened version of Psalm 8 and show you a wonderful picture that goes with it. People are so small next to you, God. You put the stars and the moon in the sky and the birds in the air above the cows and horses in the fields and the fish that swim in the seas. You created all the beauty in the world. Isn't it great that we have the Psalms that were read by Jesus and later Hildegard? And now we can still read them too. Let's fold our hands and close our eyes and pray. Dear God, thank you for the Psalms and for people like Hildegard who followed God and read the Psalms and that we can read them and follow you too. Amen. At this time, I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Greg Thiessen. As mentioned earlier, Greg is the Metzger Collection Manager at Columbia Bible College, as well as Assistant Registrar and Instructor. Originally from Chilliwack, he studied Biblical Studies at Columbia Bible College for two years before receiving a BA in History from Trinity Western University, and finally an MA in Theological Studies with a concentration in Church History from Regent College in Vancouver. Breaking up this westward, westward progression, Greg spent eight months living in a monastery in Northern Ireland and, after graduation from Regent, moved to Malawi in Africa, where he taught at the Evangelical Bible College of Malawi for over two years. After returning from Malawi, Greg served as Associate Pastor at the First United Mennonite Church in Vancouver, now Peace Church on 52nd. Greg and his wife, Afton, have three children, Felicity, Brendan, and Aidan, and live in Abbotsford and attend Level Ground Mennonite Church. Greg is passionate about history, Christian unity, and discipleship. The title of his sermon, in case you didn't see it in the bulletin, is A Selection in Her Story, Important Women in Christian History You've Probably Never Heard Of but should. Thank you so much, Greg, for coming to speak to us today. Before we hear from Greg, uh, we'll hear the scripture readings he selected for his sermon, read by Mary Dirksen, Anna McNeil, and Sonia McNeil. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Matthew 16 verse 24 Hello. Thank you for this opportunity you've given me to preach to you and uh, for welcoming me into your homes. Thank you for that and your hospitality. Uh, now, to my understanding, you've been going through a sermon series on the story and tracking particularly through the narrative of the Bible. And I consider it my joy today to share with you that the story is not over. 
but in fact continues beyond the New Testament through Christian history even to today. Now, last Sunday was Pentecost, marking the coming of the Holy Spirit on the disciples, which we read about in the book of Acts. Now, typically the fuller name given to the book of Acts is Acts of the Apostles, but I think even a more fitting title is Acts of the Holy Spirit. As such, the book of Acts is merely an introduction to the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church in history. The Holy Spirit has been at work and people have been responsive to his leading and on journeys of discipleship throughout the course of the roughly 2,000 years from then to now. Now, those of you who know me a little bit uh, know very well that I am passionate about history and particularly about church history. And what ignited my passion initially is through the discovery of the cloud of witnesses around us. Individual Christians who live radically as followers of Christ, um, who I would argue have, as Christ called us as disciples, to take up our cross and follow him. Sometimes literally, uh, at other times in new and unique uh, opportunities that different contexts uh, allow. And as I learned about these saints, both capital S and small s saints throughout history, I have been struck by their examples. I have been challenged in my own uh, walk of discipleship. And I am encouraged by Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, where he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that Christ lived a long time ago. He lived 2,000 years ago in a very different context from our own. And this idea that Paul gives uh, is one not only true of him, uh, but true of other Christians throughout history and even other Christians to our very day. That we can look to one another and we can look to the saints of the past as models of Christ-likeness, uh, exemplars that we might follow uh, and, and imitate. Uh, and so today, I am going to share with you four uh, stories. And I could have picked some, some big names, uh, but part of the reality in the discipline of history is that it tends to be dominated by male voices. And so I want to push against that and today uh, share four voices of women. A portion of the selection of women that I had on exhibit in the Metzger collection. A selection in history, important women in hi Christian history you've probably never heard of, but should. In, in this sermon being brought to you by the letter M, I am going to talk about martyrs, a monk, a missionary, and a minister to the marginalized. And so let's jump in with, with looking at a couple of martyrs, Perpetua and Felicity. So I'll even uh, put on a button for, for Perpetua and Felicity. And uh, you might already know from me, um, Felicity, our daughter, is named after, yes, this Felicity. Perpetua and Felicity were North African martyrs who died in and around the year 203 in the city of Carthage in North Africa. In this walk of discipleship, taking up their cross and following Christ, literally dying for Christ. And so here we have uh, an image of Perpetua and Felicity. And this is from a 6th century mosaic uh, found in the city of Ravenna in Italy. Now, this is pretty white. And as North Africans, they probably weren't that white. And so I also have a modern icon uh, which shows uh, the, that they were, in fact, women of color. Now a little bit about their story, and, and I wish I could, I could talk this whole sermon just about these two, but I, I will need to keep it brief 
And if you want to learn more about some of these women or of more uh, women, I will include a link and you can, you can read up a little bit more. Uh, but we don't exactly know the age of Felicity, but Perpetua was about 22 years old when she was martyred. And what's notable about them is Perpetua was actually the master and Felicity was the slave. And so the social inequality between them. We know uh, very little about them apart from what's included in the account of their martyrdom. And in fact, this is mostly penned by Perpetua herself. Uh, as they are in prison, she writes about some vision she encounters. She writes about her father actually trying to plead with her to just go ahead, renounce Christ, sacrifice to idols so that she can save herself uh, and be there as a mother for her infant child. Uh, and yet, in response to her father, she says, um, look, at, look at a water pot. Um, could you call it anything other than a water pot? Uh, and her father says, no. Well, so to me, uh, I cannot be called anything but what I am. And that's a Christian. So these, these two are imprisoned. Eventually, they go to die in an arena, facing off against gladiators and wild animals. And in their moment of death, as they are jeered and watched by the crowds of pagans, what is remarkable is that they do not die as master and slave. Rather, they die arm in arm as equals in Christ. And as such, they completely undercut the social norms of Roman society. And they are bold and public witnesses to Christ and to the gospel. And so they are the first uh, women I wanted to, to note. Next, I'm going to talk about Hildegard. Of Bingen. Hildegard of Bingen uh, was a German nun who lived from 1098 to 1179. And in her own context, in which there was no longer any persecution of Christians, uh, there was not that ability to take up your cross uh, literally and follow Christ as a martyr. And so following Christ who took on other forms. And one of the early streams of discipleship that emerged was that of monasticism uh, and embracing a life of um, self-denial and of prayer and of community. And so Hildegard of Bingen, of Bingen took up that call. And so here we have an image of, of her. And in fact, uh, this, this image is one. Here, I'll, I'll show you it uh, a little bit closer. So this image is one that she herself uh, drew. And so this is a self-portrait. And here she is receiving uh, revelation. Um, and she wrote about uh, her visions in this way a fiery light of the greatest flashing brightness coming out of a cloudless sky flooded my entire mind and so inflamed my whole heart and my whole breast like a flame. Now this piece is actually an image we get from, from her book, um, of uh, Book of Divine Works, uh, which is a, a reflection and a meditation on the, the uh, uh, book of John, chapter 1. Uh, and it's a portion of this other page, which I have a larger image there, uh, which is a theophany or, or um, a revelation of divine love. And so there's the, her receiving uh, this vision. Now, she had visions from a very early age, 
And uh, in fact, her story is interesting in that she was the last of 10 children. And she, so when she was the age of eight, she was dedicated to a Benedictine monastery as a tithe from her parents. And so she grew up in a monastery, actually. And she later embraced the monastic life for herself and had these visions all the way from, from childhood, but didn't actually start sharing them until she felt uh, this call to public ministry in her 40s. And that's when she started to write down her works and to publish her works and share them. Now, beyond being a mystic and experiencing these visions, uh, Hildegard was a true polymath involved in, in a bunch of different disciplines. Um, and she was a musical composer, a visual artist, as you can see, a poet, a playwright, a theologian, a scientist, especially um, studying medicine and, and horticulture. Uh, and she, she even had a recipe for cookies, uh, cookies of joy, she called them. Uh, and they, they really are quite tasty. Uh, I can share the recipe with you if, if you like. Um, and so this, this remarkable woman who, who goes on preaching tours, composes dozens of songs, and, uh, and this coming out of this vocation of monasticism, out of this life of prayer and contemplation, and yet through that and her experiences of that and communion with God in that, uh, opening doors to ministry uh, and, and pushing beyond the confines of the, the monastery. Now, next, we're going to turn to our missionary. And I could have chosen a, a number of women for, for this, but I am going to talk about, oh, I'll show you the, the button, about Rebecca Proton. Now, Rebecca Proton is probably not uh, the kind of missionary you might first be thinking of. Um, and she was an 18th century mulatto, so that's half black, half white, and uh, early on a slave in the Caribbean. Uh, she was born in the island of Antigua and at the age of seven or eight was kidnapped from her family and sold into slavery in St. Thomas, and uh, later on came into contact with some Moravian missionaries. Um, I can't talk at too great at length about the Moravians right now, but they were among the earliest Protestants who had a vision for global missions. Uh, and so she encountered some missionaries uh, to the Caribbean and was... Um, eventually ordained as a minister herself and was ministering to the local slaves and preaching to them, uh, which is significant because she knew the language, uh, which these Moravian missionaries didn't. Uh, and so she was instrumental in, in ministering among these, uh, these the slave population. Uh, here we have an image of a Moravian church congregation uh, with the um, few Moravian, uh, European Moravian missionaries, and then, then the rest of the congregation being, being African. And so Rebecca was a, a minister in this context, um, but it's, it's quite this incredible story about being a slave, to a free woman, uh, to then a global traveler. Uh, because where she starts off in the Caribbean, uh, right there, she eventually moves to uh, Moravia, uh, to Herrenhut, uh, where the Moravians are, are based. Uh, and then even eventually goes with her husband, Christian Proton, uh, to the Gold Coast of Africa. And what is now Ghana, and preaches is a missionary there as well as a, 
involved in a school for mulatto children there. And we can encounter with her story that in a lot of ways, being half black, half white, uh, in that particular context especially, she would have uh, found incredible difficulties uh, fitting into either context, uh, that of the uh, white population or of the black population. And yet she would also have had unique opportunities to preach uh, and to minister. And so it's, I really see in, in her case, this, this idea that to take up our cross and, and follow Christ and, and live this life of discipleship is to have a willingness to let Christ redeem our unique stories. Even ones characterized by suffering, things like slavery, things like the hardship of, of not fitting in anywhere. And yet God can use those and redeem those things to build his kingdom. And certainly he did that uh, through individuals like Rebecca Proton, and he can also do that through individuals like us. Now, lastly, I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Fry. And you may or may not be familiar with Elizabeth Fry. She lived from 1780 to 1845. And she took up her cross and followed Christ as a minister to the marginalized, or you could also see it as a social justice activist. Now, Elizabeth Fry was born in Norwich in England, and she grew up in a wealthy Quaker family and was very well educated and also married a rich factory owner, Joseph Fry. And so in among the elites uh, within the wealthy uh, in uh, polished British society. Another interesting point about her is that she was the mother of 12. Uh, and as I go on to say a little bit of what she did, keep that in mind that she did this while also being a mother of 12. There we, there we have uh, a picture of Elizabeth Fry. She uh, is known for prison reform. And what uh, almost scandalously she did is actually visited prisoners. And prisons at this time were, were horribly run. There, there were brutal punishments, even for things like pickpocketing. There could be the death sentence. This was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Um, prisons themselves uh, were, were places where hunger, disease, overcrowding, lawlessness ran rampant. And so many were, even of the wardens, were afraid to enter into these prisons. Uh, and here this, this polite uh, middle-aged woman goes and, and enters them. Uh, and uh, leads Bible studies among the, the women of the prison. So here we have a, a famous image of her uh, reading the Bible in a women's prison uh, from 1860. Well, she documented what she experienced in these women prisons, uh, some of the conditions that she found within, and she advocated for, for better conditions, for social reform. Further than that, um, argued for a whole different ideology for prisons. Rather than prisons being punitive or, or even um, characterized by revenge on criminals, uh, rather being geared towards restorative justice, uh, bringing these prisoners back into society. And to this end, she traveled all around Britain, Ireland, even continental Europe. And what we can take away from her story is that she challenged the injustices and oppressions of the established order and changed the very ethos of institutional structures in the process. Uh, rather than being constrained by polite society, she used any privilege she had 
to improve the lot of the downtrodden. Uh, and so this, this minister, this champion of the marginalized, uh, this act, uh, firm activist. Now, I hope you have been a little bit inspired by these stories, even though I had to keep it fairly short for each of them. And these are just a mere selection of four from the, the great number that I could have chosen, even some of those that were included the, in the exhibit. And if you wanted to read up more about them, I encourage you to take a look at, at this link that I'm providing you with. Um, and, but even beyond these kinds of circumstances and in all sorts of circumstances and all sorts of contexts and, and ages throughout history, uh, we see individuals being used by God. Now, the narratives I've given you have been fairly glowing summaries of each of these women. Uh, that is not suggesting that everything about them is exemplary. Thanks be to God, though, that the saints of the past, and in fact, just like the cloud of witnesses, uh, the, the particular individuals from the Old Testament named in Hebrews chapter 11, are not perfect by any means, but fallen people who, despite and even sometimes through their weaknesses, God uses for his glory. And that gives me hope that God can work through me and through you for his kingdom and his glory. Now we find, and I have found, inspiration from these women and, and these, this broader cloud of witnesses even beyond uh, the biblical text. And I hope that you will uh, be inspired and, and even look for who in history might you rally behind? Uh, might you seek to, as Paul says, uh, follow their example as they follow the example of Christ? Uh, or even as you look to other saints in our own midst. And so I, I leave you with these stories and I pray that you would, in, in whatever way that God is calling you to uniquely do this in our own times, to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Thanks for, for having me.
Sizo hambanaye, wo wo wo, Sizo hambanaye. Gomla wecha hula, Sizo hambanaye. Gomla wela hula, Sizo hambanaye. We will walk with God, my brothers. We will walk with God. We will walk. I invite you now into a time of prayer. O oh Lord, creator of the moon and stars and all that is good, we come to you rejoicing for our walk with you, thankful for the many who have gone before us, including women who have died in your name, who have worked tirelessly on behalf of the poor and homeless and marginalized. We're thankful to hear their stories and learn about you from them. We bring before you the massive and disturbing events of the past days, the violence, the injustice, the fear, but also the hope that your Holy Spirit through us will turn violence to peace and hatred to love. We are thankful for your church in the midst of this. Emmanuel, MCBC, Mennonite Church Canada and USA, and all the churches across the globe doing your work. Breathe upon your congregation. Burn us with your presence new. We think of those in our own congregation living in isolation. Ease their loneliness. Continue to walk with them. Help us to continue to find ways to connect in these challenging times. We pray for individuals who are facing hardships at this time. Silas Boynton, Wayne Duickman, Frank Dick Garibaldi, Frank and Ann Dick, Margaret Ediger, John Friesen, Fred and Sue Caitler, Helen Krauss and family, Hilde Krauss, Mary Letkman, John Redekup, John Taze, Hans and Mika Taves, Mary Welk, and Dan Zare and family. We go into the world knowing that we can trust in you completely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our benediction and closing song, I invite you to hear and sing the words of Teresa of Avila. She was born in 1515, a Spanish noblewoman who felt called to the monastic life. She was a religious reformer, 
author of several books, and a theologian. I will read first her poem, and then for our closing song, I invite you to sing in Spanish or English, Nada Te Turbe, or Nothing Can Trouble, a musical setting of her poem by Jacques Berthier of the Taizé community. William will play the melody once, then I invite you to join us for three times through, and William will play the melody alone to close the song and the service. So here's the poem, Teresa of Avila, Poems 9. Let nothing disturb you, nothing alarm you. While all things fade away, God is unchanging. Be patient, and you will gain everything. For with God in your heart, nothing is lacking. God meets your every need. Thank you.